Today we are doing something crazy. Today we are putting the two masters of, I guess, screenwriting, but also story theorists, up against one another to see how their ideas compare. We are talking about a Robert McKee versus John Truby battle royale. Specifically, Story by Robert McKee versus The Anatomy of Story by John Truby. So what I'm going to be doing in this video is I'm going to be giving us some basic stats. Then I'm going to be talking about their discussions of character, antagonist, theme, conflict, subtext, genre, scene construction, and then giving overall thoughts on the books and their examples. So this is going to be a fun video. Let's go. Okay, editing Nicole here. So this video was super dense. Um, you can see it's also quite long and watching it back I talked very quickly as I do so I have tried to ameliorate that in numerous ways so number one I have an infographic now that I created on my website with like the differences by each category between John Truby and Robert McKee exactly what they say the terminology it's very summarized for copyright reasons but hopefully that will help you follow along second of all I've slowed the video way down so I am talking much slower um, at a normal person's rate, hopefully. Third of all, I've actually split the video into two parts. I was going to kind of react to reviews and sort of tell you whether you should trust them or not and how accurate those criticisms were. That'll happen later. <laughs> and then three or four, I think I might do yet again another much shorter version of this. Um, which is like, I don't know, like eight minutes, <laughs> like I did for Save the Cat versus Anatomy of Story, where it's better for people who just want like a quick look. So let me know about that fourth one, but that is all what is coming. I still think this is a good video. I spent a lot of time doing the analysis, so I hope you enjoy it. Story by Robert McKee was published in 1997, and it is on Amazon with 2,283 reviews. Anatomy of Story by John Truby was published in 2007, and it is on Amazon with 2,402 reviews. So they're fairly similar, um, strong audiences. Obviously, they have a lot of people reading them, and almost the same number of reviews. Both Robert McKee and John Truby, though, have worked extensively as story consultants in Hollywood, as well as like run lots of classes and written lots of books and lots of articles and blog posts and things on story itself. And so they're fairly similar in their expertise. All right, let's go. Let's get right into it. We're going to start with character. So both McKee and Truby discuss character change. Um, John Truby can discusses the concept of desire and need. So desire is what the character wants. Need is <laughs> what they need, which is related to like their weakness and their change. Robert McKee calls it a conscious and unconscious desire. Conscious being the goal, unconscious being analogous to the need. I honestly think that the word need is a little bit more intuitive for me, but that's just down to vocabulary. They have sort of the same basic thoughts on like what defines your sort of basic character. Robert McKee really has two points on characters in his book, like to if we really narrow it down. The first one is that deep character is different than characterization. And the second is that deep character is revealed by choice under pressure, escalating to a final choice at the climax of the book. Later, he talks about the key to true character being desire. Um, so what we said before, the conscious and unconscious desire. And he also talks about dimensions and contradictions. And this was a really, really interesting point that's also related to story engineering. We don't hear as much or as explicitly or as in the same way in anatomy of story about those dimensions of characters, that characters should not be exactly as they seem. And we should, re while we see their characterization at first, their deeper character should be revealed and should surprise us sometimes as we get to know them. And that Robert McKee really uses that sort of revelation, that contradiction, that surprise as a key marker of a really good story. Truly really narrows in on need, desire, and character change. He links these things to the theme and moral argument very deeply. Though McKee talks about choice under pressure, Truly talks about moral choice. 
This is basically the same thing, although Truby is more talking about sort of the under surf the surface connectivity, what choice should be made um, to fit the overall book and to be meaningful to the overall book. McKee's choice under pressure, I feel like, is more sort of in the moment, what the character is doing, more feeling, more visceral, where Truby's is a little bit more analytical in terms of, I know this is sort of the theme of the novel or the moral argument, and in order to support that, we need to have the moral choice, which of course is made under pressure. Just we don't talk about it as explicitly in Anatomy of Story. Also in a different uh, part of the book, McKee talks about not choosing between good and evil, but between two unique, irreconcilable desires and creating a real dilemma. And Truby also talks about the different um, sort of kinds of antagonism you can have and encourages you to move beyond good and evil. In terms of casts, and so differentiating your larger cast of characters, McKee takes a personality approach. So he says that supporting roles are inspired by the central character, and they're designed to delimiate complex dimensions. So I mentioned complex dimensions again, seeing parts of the character that we didn't expect. And so he has this great web where he has the character in the middle, and it says, okay, we see like the really sweet and thoughtful part of this character, when she is with her best friend and we see this like, you know, um, badass part of the character when she is doing her job, that kind of thing. Truby focuses more on function and archetype in his cast and also differentiating supporting characters' belief systems from the heroes and comparing their weakness, need, desire, values, power, status, ability. So again, Truby is kind of going back to that moral argument because belief system is basically about around the moral argument of the story and how you should show those different belief systems. In terms of antagonists and opponents, both have a four corner of opposition diagram and they both talk a lot about values. The key's point is about bringing the story to the end of the line of that value, the negation of the negation, and how the value of the story changes throughout. Again, if you've looked into story grid, you would recognize these ideas again. The idea that you have a life value, whether it's life and death or success and failure, and throughout the book, you're kind of moving, changing between the different variations of that value. You can go from success to compromise to failure to failure just masquerading as success. All of those different ones. Truby takes a value cluster approach to defining the hero's opponents and showing conflict. Truby gets a little bit more concrete and actually brings that to be specific to the characters. So he is really again focusing on the moral argument thing where you have these clusters of values all related to sort of your moral through line, your theme, and how those values con conflict. So you have a hero, four corners of opposition, and different values and conflicts. So the hero might value family, the antagonist might value money, the hero might value aesthetics, the antagonist might value thriftiness. And those things, some of those directly conflict, it's very obvious some of them are a little more under the surface and you give these sort of clusters of values that define how the characters are making their decisions these are different techniques that i think can be done simultaneously in a story you use truby's four corners to create conflict in the story through conflicting values and the result and effect of that conflict turns the story's global value allowing you to progress forward I do think that Sean Coyne's um, diagrams of value progression show this more intuitively than the opposition diagrams in story. Um, my understanding is that these values shift but aren't constantly in conflict. So you cannot be alive and in conflict with dead. You like move over. So I will show Robert McKee's has like the arrows where Sean Coyne does this progression. I think the arrows works for Truby's version but actually this progression sliding scale of value makes more sense in the way that McKee is talking about it. All right, and now we're getting into theme between the two of them.
So both take the concept of theme and use it or describe it in a similar sentence. John Truby calls your theme the moral argument, something like a man's riches comes not from the money he makes, but the friends and family he serves, or a person's love. A person lives a much happier life when she gives to others, or understanding why we act and whether it is right is always uncertain. McKee calls it the controlling idea consisting of a value and a cause, something like justice triumphs because the protagonist is tenaciously resourceful and courageous. Passion turns to violence and destroys our lives when we use people as objects of pleasure. So you can see kind of McKee's is a little bit more formulaic there. John Truby's is a little bit more, I don't know if you'd call it universal, but might be a little bit more difficult to find your way into the story from a sentence like understanding why we act and whether it is right is always uncertain. Whereas something like success triumphs when we realize that we can't fully understand our actions might be a little bit easier to find your way into with McKee's version, but that I think that's a very personal choice. Both discuss very uh, different kinds of thematic ideas. So Truby talks about good versus bad, tragedy, pathos, and black comedy. McKee talks about idealism and pessimism, and then both discuss ironic ideas. So when I say that, it's sort of the overall arch of your story. So a tragedy will have like a tragic theme, Good versus bad will have maybe a more morality theme, um, etc. I really like how general McKee's descriptions were because with idealism and pessimism, he is discussing upending and downending stories, with the irony being kind of in the middle. He doesn't discuss idealistic endings in detail beyond good versus evil. Um, but I think that's because he assumes the idealistic ending in the rest of the chapter. So his whole chapter is kind of about the character having a positive arc, more or less. Um, and then he kind of goes in and says, any of these special forms or black comedy, etc., this is how it changes. So there's a lot of similarity there. Um, and it's very interesting to see the different ways that they categorize those different kind of arcs of themes. Truby goes a step forward and gives tools into how to actually make the argument, the controlling idea, come through. He talks about weakness, need, immoral action, attack by ally, obsessive drive, moral self-revelation, moral decision, etc. McKee, meanwhile, speaks of ideas and counter ideas and gives lots of examples. Counter ideas being characters or situations that express the opposite of your controlling idea to kind of, you know, if it's success triumphs when we value our people, our friends and family over money, then you would have a counter idea of someone who is choosing money over friends and family. He discusses how the story's climax should dramatize the story's meaning and have a final action that excites and moves you. And I would argue that final action is basically the same as the moral decision from John Truby, because your moral decision is meant to excite and move you, <laughs> or excite and move the audience anyways. Arguably, this is the same approach. I found McKee's a little bit harder to find on the page in terms of theme and maybe a little bit less practical, whereas Truby lays out the tools for this more explicitly and gives end-to-end -end examples of how it's done. McKee gives examples, but they're kind of picked through. Truby really goes and shows it for one story, which can be very helpful in applying it. We're talking about conflict now. So Truby talks about values and conflict and obstacles preventing a protagonist from achieving their desire. McKee presents this concept called the gap, and I found the gap one of the best things in the book. I found it very fresh and interesting. The idea is that conflict is the gap between expectation and result. My hero thinks X will happen, but then Y happens. Conflict. <laughs> there is also a discussion of the risks characters are willing to take and how they take greater and greater risks with each new action as they move towards the climax. 
Again, I really like that, that focus on ramping up the stakes. In terms of causality, which Truby also talks about, I find the idea of the gap very helpful. Causality being, you know, nothing in the story is random. The character does this, and so this happens, and so this happens, and so that happens. In the same chapter that McKee talks about the gap, he discusses the magic if which is the idea that you think, and it comes from acting, if I were this character in these circumstances, what would I do? And I found that was a very helpful practical technique and not something I'd necessarily thought of before. It seems very obvious, but it's hard to get your, you know, sometimes as the writer, you're like, I'm here as the writer. Whereas he is, was really a focus on be the character. Now we are talking about and comparing subtext and dialogue. Truby's points on dialogue are very helpful. I like how he talks about good dialogue progressing from being about action to being about sort of a person's essence with starters such as you are. He talks about story dialogue, moral dialogue, and motifs. Again, I really like how he breaks it down. Um, he talks about, you know, how moral dialogue works so a character proposes in a course of action another character opposes it and you have a good setup for that kind of moral dialogue he also talks about subtext and he talks about subtext as in characters having a hidden desire and an indirect plan to get it so if my character is saying hey um i would like to pick up my cds from your house or something maybe they're secretly either like their hidden desire is I want to see if we can get back together. And they have sort of that indirect plan to figure it out. McKee gets deeply into subtext with a very long example as part of a scene analysis from Casablanca. He says that all text is subtext and puts it into the context of action and reaction. So the action is what the character is really doing under the surface. So in his example, he has. Um, Rick from Casa Rick is it Rick? Yeah, Rick from Casablanca saying in a scene to Isla, well, you can tell me now, I'm reasonably sober. And McKee identifies the action there as he's pleading, he's getting down on his knees, sort of. So there's similarities. I kind of liked McKee's approach to subtext a little bit better because I don't know if characters or people are even always thinking of their own subtext you know what i mean i might want something and not be consciously thinking of it but i also really like the way mckee talks about action and reaction in terms of context and what we're really th what they're really thinking under the surface versus what they're saying i know that that sounded like the same thing it's not he McKee really breaks it down into like basic beats, which is helpful, and those beats are meant to be kind of the subtext. It's a very interesting discussion from both of them on how subtext works and how you can create it. In terms of genre, this is going to be short. In my opinion, neither tackles genre particularly well. Anatomy of Story doesn't really touch it. Hold on for Anatomy of Genre. It is out. It is there, it is coming, it is along, <laughs> but I'm working on reading it. Um, and then McKee also has genre, but it's just such a long list that I don't find it particularly useful. You might though. All right, so then they talk about scene construction. Both encourage you to write dialogue last, which I think is a screenwriting thing, although I doubt Aaron Sorkin would agree. <laughs> and it's basically like they don't want you to write a good line of dialogue and then be like, oh, I have to keep this line of dialogue when you don't have like the rest of the scene there. They also both talk about how you should let your character's actions tell the story. Truby suggests rewriting a scene over and over. So add action, then story dialogue, then moral dialogue. When I first read this book, I thought, no way. But now that I'm very, very deep into editing my book and rewriting scenes 
over and over and doing multiple editing passes, I'm actually very on board because it's helpful to think of those different things. Like in this one, I'm going to make sure that the description is good. In this one, I'm going to make sure that the scene turns properly. In this one, in this pass, I'm going to make sure that there's some moral dialogue, etc. McKee has two big scene analyses where we're analyzing at the beat level. In terms of actual writing, he suggests writing a treatment first, and only then do you add dialogue with the idea that characters will be dying to speak by that point. He says that the premature writing of dialogue chokes creativity. Again, I think that's more screenwriting and less novel writing, but that's just me. His principle is always write from the outside in. Um, so writing from the outside in as and you're not like imposing yourself on the characters, you're getting the characters to come out like this. He also talks about turning points in scenes, and I love the whole concept of, you know, progressive complication, turning point, crisis, climax, resolution in a scene. I find that an incredibly helpful framework. And of course, McKee talks about how you need to keep trying and retrying your turning points. He says turning points must be imagined, discarded, reimagined, and then played out in text and subtext. Super cool. Again, linking the turning point to the text and subtext, a reminder of thinking that what is under the surface and your character doesn't necessarily have to say or even potentially think exactly what that crisis is. Both, interestingly, really advocate writing and rewriting and, you know, keeping at it and keep changing it up until you get something that's really good. And I think that makes sense because I think we all know that writing is rewriting. Good to see it from both their perspectives. And so then we go to overall. So my overall thoughts on the content of the books. I find McKee's is more helpful at a micro level for creating powerful scenes. I often think of his points while I'm writing. So a reminder to look in the character's heads, a reminder to use subtext. What is the turning point? What is the value shift? The action, reaction, what is the character doing? What are they really doing? I find his principles are very organic and a more sort of emotional way to approach scenes. And it's a good reminder to bring that emotion in sometimes. I personally can get so into the, this is what's happening in the story. This is what has to happen. We have to make this happen for the plot to work and the character needs to get through it. But I kind of forget some of that emotionality. And so I think about a lot of those principles from the book as I revise scenes. True Beef for me is more of a macro way to look at story and is very useful when you're looking at the overall sort of arch and arc of your story. Since my story is more or less kind of, like I feel good about, more or less good about the plot now and the characters, etc. I'm referring to it like a little bit less, but very much so it's all built on a structure from John Truby. So currently my thoughts are that I have ingrained much more of John Truby's points. So weakness, need, desire, character values, ensuring all characters are a variation on the hero's moral problem. These are things that I do now automatically without even thinking, oh yeah, I should do that anatomy of story thing. I'm like, okay, and put your characters to the corner. And you know, that's it's there, but that's because I have read this book many, many times and I first read it like 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, so I know it fairly well. I go back and reference story more, but that's because I've read it more recently and only once and partially, so obviously you have to review. Um, I don't know it as well as I know Anatomy of Story, but it's also partially because I found it hard to retain some of the key points. And I'm going to get into that in a moment. So the content of a book is always an important thing to chat about, but so is the actual book. <laughs> so uh, let's chat about the actual book of these. So 
when I looked at these Amazon reviews, there are lots of complaints about both books being overwritten and lengthy. And let's be real, no one would ever call these books brief. <laughs> I find Anatomy of Story much easier to get through because it has less flowery language and more examples. Story has hundreds of examples, but I feel like Anatomy of Story either has more or they're done in a more helpful manner. I'm going to talk about that again. It also is a more step-by-step -step process overall. For example, the premise chapter, he gives you, you know, step-by-step -step to getting a premise. There's less on the designing principle. We've talked about that. The designing principle is a hard concept. Thank you, everybody who has been in my comments telling me what the designing principle is. I actually really appreciate it. So if you don't know what it is, I will link the video where everybody else has told us, and it's useful to read, in my opinion. So in Anatomy of Story, there's also a summary followed by an overarching example at the end of every chapter, which is a very helpful structure, especially for reference. I find story structure incredibly confusing. It talks about character in like three different chapters, some of which don't even have character in the title. Like antagonism is technically about character, but it's a separate chapter from character. It tells you what you're shooting for in the finished product, which is great. Story does really, though, go beyond the mac macro structure things, which are very important, getting a little bit more into the raw emotional human things and getting reactions and changes and emotionality that fit and that ring true to audiences. So I see this sort of a spiral writing a book, right, between macro and micro. When you're planning t scenes, you're taking a very trivia approach. Where is this on my character's arc? What problems do I need to solve? What is my strategy? What values are in conflict? What are the character's desires? <laughs> and then that overlaps and then wings into the keys, which is what are the character's desires? Of course. What do they expect to happen? What do they mean with what they're saying in each beat? And where is the shift? I love to talk about examples. So my final thing here um, on the story <laughs> before we get into a summary and then reviews is about the examples. So interestingly, these books were written 10 years apart, but they use very similar examples. The Godfather, Chinatown, Casablanca, they must really be like the best, some of the best movies because at least before 2007, um, because they both pull heavily from those. I do appreciate John Tupi pulling in some newer examples, newer as in new in 2007. <laughs> uh, so things like Pride and Prejudice and Harry Potter, although I don't necessarily agree with him on the premise or designing principles for Harry Potter, but fair enough. The seventh book had just come out, maybe he hadn't read it. <laughs> so, um, Truby also takes his examples and applies his principles to them very strongly. So when he's saying, this is how you write a premise, he writes out the premise exactly how he says, this is how you write a premise for every single example. For, um, you know, these are the 22 plot steps, he has a thing and he's like, these are the 22 plot steps for my example. Um, so he puts every example into his language and structures it so it's easy to read and reference. I really enjoyed um, McKee's detailed examples, specifically like the magic if in Chinatown and the subtext in Casablanca, but his other examples are used more as discussion points within the text and they're kind of harder to reference. So, and then the final note is I think chapters of these books, I really prefer Truby's. He, there's the fade out versus the never ending story. Those are the names of the last chapters. The millipede metaphor and story was just weird. I didn't get it. If you got it, let me know if you love it. But it was strange. So, the biggest reason that I like the anatomy of story better, and I'm going to be honest, I like the anatomy of story slightly better than story, is the formatting. That is the strange thing to say, but in anatomy of story, there are bullet points. There are subtitles for examples. 
There are short sections with very descriptive and relevant headings. There are summaries at the end of every chapter. The examples are broken down and bullet pointed. Maybe this is wimpy, but it makes it way more readable. And every page has a subtitle, a call out, a list, something to break up the text where a story is much more thick chunks of text without lots of breakouts or diagrams for pages. And that just makes the readability and the referenceability much more difficult. So for me, Anatomy of Story is my preferred reading reference experience, although they both have very similar and very helpful insights. So there we go. John Truby versus Robert McKee in detail. I'm very curious what you think. Have you read both of these books? Do you want to read either one of them now that you've heard me chat about them? And thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.